Hi, library friends. <laughs> library friends. Could be a new sitcom, couldn't it? Library friends. And um, welcome back to another episode of The Library Is Open, darling. So I hope you brought your library card. Sorry, I haven't got any socks on, so I'm just going to put them on now while I speak. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. It's a really rainy day today. It's dead dull and overcast. Uh, autumn is definitely on the way. Um, and I am cheering myself up by wearing uh, my Buffy the Vampire Slayer t-shirt, which is a season one production still, I think. Yes, um, which seems appropriate for this episode, given that um, we are about to discuss a pretty kick-ass character and a, you know, well, it's a cliche to use the word strong female lead. I guess that's kind of the best description, really. Although I did read an interesting discussion uh, the other day, I think it might have been on Twitter as an exchange, or it might have been an article, I can't remember, that was talking about um, the concept of strong female leads and how actually, um, while it's a great thing in terms of representation, we've got to be really careful that we're not uh, being reductive with these characters and um, making them... You know how that whole thing, particularly representation of people, um, we're not just boiling them down to like one characteristic or stereotype when they're actually fully fleshed out humans, you know. Um, so just something to bear in mind that I thought was really, really interesting, like a sort of, I suppose, potential, not downfall, but maybe pitfall to avoid in creating characters. Um, so yeah, um, without further ado, let me introduce the book I wanted to talk about today. Um, so, and then I'll do my spiel. So, you may have seen this in my End of Summer haul, if you've watched that. Um, this is book one of a trilogy, uh, Girls of Paper and Fire, by Natasha and Gan. Um, and the second is Girls of Storm and Shadow. I forget the title of the third one, but I know it comes out in February, so it's a trilogy, basically. And just look at that cover as well, for a start. It's beautiful, isn't it? I love that scheme of sort of um, pink yellow and blue, really sort of mystical tones. Um, and I think it's fair to say, just pouring my coffee, coffee today. Uh, who am I? Who am I? Ring the changes. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, this is maybe originally not a book I would have done a review on, but it actually had um, a, a really positive <clears throat> effect on me um, in terms of like sparking ideas that I wanted to talk about in, in these videos um, because ostensibly on the surface you know uh, this could be conflated with a lot of young adult fiction uh, of the fantasy genre I'm sure you go to any bookshop be it a, a, you know a sort of chain bookshop or an independent one and you go to YA fantasy and you will see um, a plethora of these kind of things. They're usually the of and titles, I call them. So it'll be a something of something or something, you know? Um, what springs to mind is like the Sarah J Maas, uh, Court of Rose and Thorns, or um, countless other examples of that. And, you know, um, I have no nothing against them. It's not particularly my style. But... Um, I saw this one advertised, and what drew me in was um, first, and form first, first and foremost, the um, both the author's background, who is I believe she's Chinese Malaysian, brought up in the UK, and now lives in Paris, which is pretty awesome, uh, kind of cultural uh, casserole, if you will. Um, and secondly, the protagonist, um, who is also um, of that culture, and that's reflected throughout the novel. Um, and actually, well, like I say, it's branded um, YA fantasy, I believe. I, I think it errs more to the A than the Y, because there's a lot in this book that I was surprised by in terms of, I don't want to say the graphic content, because, um, you know, I don't want to be sort of alarmist and go, oh, it's graphic, although it is in places, but not, it, not gratuitously so. Um, but more in the way that it handled the themes really nicely. There's a sweet spot, I think, when in fiction, when you're handling like quite difficult themes of um, uh, not being overly gratuitous 
um, and not giving us enough and also of not sort of flanneling and uh, but also taking it seriously enough and this just falls right in the middle. Um, so a little bit about the plot to exchange that. Our main character is <clears throat> Lee who is um, the, the world we encounter um, in, in the novel. Let me just find the map to show you. This is not the uh, map of that, I don't think. I'll show you the map when it comes to that part of the explanation because it's not the full world map, I thought it was. Um, the world we encounter is split into three castes of people. So, um, Lee belongs to the, uh, or it could be Lai, Lee or Lai, I will check on that, <clears throat> belongs to the paper caste, which is sort of the lowest caste of people, and they are completely human. Uh, the second cast up is the steel cast, which is um, primarily humans, but they have features of animals. Um, so, for instance, it might be a humanoid shape, but with antlers or, you know, feathers if they're from the bird sort of species sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> the third is the moon cast and they're sort of fully demon. In this world it's sort of like uh, de the demon is represented by the animal features. So with something like that, um, the moon cast, they are like almost entirely um, animal looking, but they still have human sort of like physiology in some respects. So it's interesting. And the idea is that, um, you know, this, this uh, is part of the mythology of the world, the gods, the ruling system, and the faith, and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, when we first meet our protagonist, her mother has been um, kidnapped many years before by the demon king, um, who is a, he takes the shape of a bull, um, and she doesn't know what's happened to her, and she's living in this small village, and then one day, uh, news of her beauty is spread, and she's captured by the king's guards and taken to the palace because she has these um, golden eyes, apparently, that um, although she's fully human, people think he's like a gift from the gods and the moon goddess specifically, I believe. And um, yeah, so she's taken to the palace after a couple of misadventures and having to leave all her family behind and so on and so forth. It's quite brutally done, actually. There's um, the sort of parting of them. And um, when she gets there, she discovers that she's been chosen to be one of the paper girls. Now, in the mythology of the series, the paper girls are eight girls who are from the paper cast who are chosen every year to become uh, concubines or courtesans to um, the king. So for a year, they live in the palace walls. I can show you the map now. This is the palace. I do love a map in a book. Look at that. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, gorgeous and um, they live there basically at his pleasure and then they are so they're trained to become as I say courtesans and um, they are summoned to his palace to basically have sex with him at his leisure um, and normally there's only eight chosen, but this year Lee has been chosen as well as a ninth one. Um, a ninth girl, which is like unprecedented, but it's because of her, you know, her reputation and her beauty and so on and so forth. Obviously she's not into this and she makes a plan to try to escape. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or rather fortunately as the case goes, she finds herself drawn to someone else. One of her fellow paper girls called Ren. And they uh, begin a very sort of soft burning um, romance. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, we follow her journey to see if she'll escape from the palace, if she'll be able to track down her mother and what happened to her, and you know, sort of what the future is. Because in the background, there's a lot of political upheaval between the castes and the clans and so on and so forth. Now, First thing I want to point out is how great the world building is in this book. Um, because it's not overly done, if that makes sense. I think world building is such a skill, by which I mean um, the sort of drawing out of what the rules of the world are, what the religion is, what it looks like geographically and so on and so forth. Um, often, you know, as with TV shows, um, 
I think authors will have a, a sort of bible, if you will, of everything that happens in the world, who all the characters are, what their connections are, and how the system operates, uh, magic, anything like that. So that's really, really well done and well thought out, but it's not over laboured. So it's similar enough to our world with quite distinct rules that's quite easy to get on board with fairly quickly. So the caste system, for instance, is fascinating. I'm quite interested in the sort of correlation between demon animal as well, though. I find that very interesting. I hope we'll get more on that as the series progresses, because uh, I think it's fascinating. I love the idea of like fused humanoid shapes with animal qualities. I mean, who hasn't wanted to fly? Or, you know, butt things with an antler. Love to butt someone with an antler. Um, so that's great. Second uh, thing I want to sort of draw attention to, as I said before, is just the way that these quite deep graphic issues are dealt with beautifully. I mean, there's a lot, and in fairness to uh, the author and the publisher, they, there is... Um, a, a, a sort of content warning at the start that the book contains uh, scenes of violence and sexual assault so that's uh, a heads up because obviously when the girls are sort of forced into um, these physical relationships with the king you know that's not a consensual act per se oftentimes their families sign them up for it hoping to curry favor with the king and um, there is one particularly harrowing sequence where uh, Lee is summoned to the king the first time and she can't go through with it. Um, although later she's forced to and it's, it's really, really quite brutal. We don't actually see, in fairness, uh, the, the scene of the assault. Uh, it's more the before leading up to and then the aftermath. But even that is very... You know, it's, it's heavy stuff. So I do think that's something to be aware of. Um, but again, being as it does come under YA, I don't think this is inappropriate for, you know, sort of maybe 14 plus sort of thing with some guidance, I hope. Um, the third thing, obviously, that I love about this is that it's queer. Um, we have a same-sex romance at the heart of the uh, novel. What's also really interesting, actually, is how sexuality is dealt with in, in this world, um, in the sense that it's... Well, heterosexuality, as in our own world, is predominantly um, the sort of, uh, I don't want to say standard, because I don't believe that. Um, the majority of people are heterosexual. There are, like, queer couples throughout, and um, some of the courtesans are male as well. Um, so, I mean, I quite like that, that it was sort of dealt with... Um, you know, as a sort of non-issue. So the issue that she's having um, this romantic attachment to Ren isn't fraught with, you know, the whole drama of coming out or, or sort of negative attitudes to sexuality. It's nothing to do with that. It's, it's simply because the romance is not allowed because they are, um, uh, basically, they belong to the king as possessions. So I really, really enjoyed that, and I think the romance is handled really nicely. I think I, I worry sometimes about, like, sort of teen-marketed romances, that they're a bit cringy, but this isn't at all. Uh, you root for both the characters uh, throughout, and they're really beautifully drawn. They each have their own sort of unique and um, nuanced backstory, whereby, you know, you don't sort of get the idea that the romantic, the romantic uh, lead, if you will, is just a sort of secondary character to throw romance in there. It's very fleshed out and of the story. So I really enjoyed that. Um, the fourth thing I love is the cliffhanger that it leaves us on. Normally I'm not a huge fan of cliffhangers, but in this case I really, really was because I think it's... Although I could kind of see maybe what was going to happen when it, it's done really, really well um, with the sparseness of the text and in a way that really sets up the next uh, couple of books. The middle one will be interesting to read because I often think in trilogies the middle book is the difficult one to get right. Um, I suppose I think of it as uh, your... <laughs> we, we th I suppose a correlation I could make is at the university we think of um, the second year as your teenage year, basically. That's when, you know, everything sort of comes to the fore and, you know, everything seems to go to hell before, like, resolving itself again in the third book. And I imagine that's quite similar in book trilogies. 
So um, I am going to get to that at some point, but I'm kind of saving myself because um, I don't want it to be over too quick because I know that the um, third one isn't out until 2021. And knowing me, I'll blitz it and then be like... <sighs> so I want to give myself a chance to sort of retain that knowledge of it. Um, so I actually completely recommend this as a really interesting and well done example of YA fantasy. What I also love is that it's a UK author as well, and a UK author, UK based, sorry, author. Well, she's Paris, but um, born in the UK, um, with a um, a storyline that pays homage to her heritage of um, sort of Malaysian and Chinese. Uh, culture and also mythology in terms of the gods and stuff because uh, I think a lot of times the YA fantasy series tend to come from American based authors and the fact that she was a, um, a sort of UK born bred author really appealed to me I really liked that um, so and once more I'm just gonna say look at that cover that's just that's just gorgeous that's lovely um, <laughs> so that's my thoughts on that and as I say I wasn't gonna make this video but I think given the content and the timeliness of that content as it continues to be so and also the way it deals with issues of violence consent and you know mistreatment justice you know these are issues that are still right at the forefront of our everyday discourse and uh, deservedly so they should be and you know when I finished reading this at the end of uh, what would have been the Manchester Pride season in, um, well, Manchester, funnily enough. Um, so the end of summer, um, you know, I thought, let's highlight something that speaks to that experience in one way or another. Um, those values, I guess, and that ethos of fighting for justice and equality um, and simultaneously protesting and celebrating. So, slightly shorter than normal, but very slightly shorter. I'm such a waffler. But that is my thoughts on uh, Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Ngan. And uh, absolute bonza. Really, really enjoyed it. Would recommend for either children, teenage acquaintances, or yourself. You know, I don't really believe in that anyway. It's like, if you're like 50 and you want to read The Famous Five, read The Famous Five. Read whatever you want. There's no rules at all. Not in this library, love. Anyway, so that's it for this episode. The library is once again closed for the time being. So put your library cards somewhere safe. Do make sure you look after yourselves, won't you? Um, I often think of you all out there in digital land and I hope you're doing well and um, thriving in the best way you can in these difficult times. Um, don't forget to check back into the library in the next episode uh, to catch up and as always, Drop a comment, drop a like, drop a subscription if you haven't already. And uh, I will see you very soon in the next episode. Much love, my darlings. Mwah.